Hi, I'm Brendan Clark. Welcome back to HPSC 3028 Philosophy of Medicine. This lecture is all about discovery, and in particular, it's about a medical discovery, uh, which is the discovery of Burkitt's lymphoma. Now, Burkitt's lymphoma is a cancer. It affects mainly children, and it affects mainly children actually in equatorial Africa. Um, now, the story of its discovery is quite interesting. It's usually attributed to this person. This is Dennis Burkitt, who was an Irish surgeon who worked in Uganda um, in the period immediately after the Second World War. Um, and the story usually goes like this, that Burkitt noticed a number of children with very unusual clinical features. Actually, they had these large facial swellings. Um, now, it's worth noting that Burkitt wasn't the first person ever to be sort of surprised by the number of children that seemed to have facial tumours. Actually, in the West, um, facial tumours are, are, in general, extremely unusual. Um, and so previous um, medical workers had, had sort of remarked on the surprising frequency of children with tumours in, the, in their faces. Um, in Africa. What they hadn't done though was to really do very much work to try and figure out what specifically was causing these 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 facial swellings, right? Um, and it's this that I think that that, uh, that Dennis Burkett really did in quite an interesting way. So actually the, the first step of this is quite straightforward and quite kind of conventional I suppose for the, the medicine of about 1950, which is that he looked at sections of tumours, different tumours from different children, um, under the microscope. And he became pretty rapidly convinced that they were all caused by the same kind of disease process, right? The, the tumours look very similar. The appearance, which you should be able to see here, is usually described as being like a starry sky, right? Um, you get this very dense field of tightly packed cell nuclei, or, or rather, of densely packed small cells with prominent nuclei and then you get these larger kind of gaps um, which the pathologists would describe as being tingible body macrophages but I, it, that's not particularly a kind of a bit of terminology that makes an awful lot of sense to me but what I think of them as, as being like is like stars right they're, they're lighter patches on this this very dark background so there was this kind of idea that um, what Berkey was seeing lots of children with these very distinctive facial swellings were because they shared a pathology under the microscope, right? They shared a pathological appearance. Were actually all kind of instances of one disease. That I suppose is pretty kind of uh, routine practice, right? The next bit of the story, though, is much less routine, which is um, an investigation that Burkett and colleagues conducted on the distribution of the disease. Now, this was prompted by this kind of um, interesting difference that they, they realised, right, that um, ch facial tumours in children in the West, so actually if you go back and look at textbooks this period, typically from the US or from the UK, facial tumours in children are vanishingly rare, very, very uncommon. But these facial tumours in African children were very, very common. Uh, in fact, they were by far the commonest uh, cancer that was seen in children. Um, this kind of macroscopic geographical distance, right, the difference between the US and the UK on the one hand and um, uh, Africa on the other, um, was something that Burkett and his colleagues got quite interested in and actually they started to do some quite interesting work on disease geography. Um, so actually the very first thing they did, which I'll, I should be able to get up as a slide here, is that they sent um, a, they, they sent some forms around to all the medical centres that they could find in Africa. They, they posted forms out and asked um, medical staff to report on this, the, the presence of this kind of unusual tumour syndrome. And actually they got back a lot of results. What's really interesting though is where they got the results from. This slide with the, the, the blue circles um, shows you actually where the positive reports of the tumour syndrome came from. Um, and what I what I hope you can see really is that there's kind of a, there's kind of a belt here, right? There's there's kind of a, a belt of cases found in, in this roughly kind of equatorial fashion. Okay, so there's a kind of tail that goes down the coast of, of Mozambique and into South Africa, 
Um, but in general, the distribution is kind of equatorial. Now, this was really interesting to, to Burkett and colleagues. Um, and actually, they went out to go and sort of investigate the distribution of the tumour further. And actually, they, they did this very kind of picturesque bit of scientific investigation, which is they did what they call a tumour safari, right? So they went out and actually looked to try and find where this tumour was and wasn't found. They went to try and establish the boundaries of the tumour belt. And what they found was really interesting, that, that actually this, the, the, the kind of initial suspicion that the tumour was distributed in this way across uh, equatorial Africa um, really did seem to be right. It didn't seem to be an artefact um, of the kind of, uh, this rather haphazard methodology of sending out questionnaires to hospitals and asking people to kind of top their head report. Uh, on whether they'd seen a particular disease. Um, in fact, this, this more on the ground kind of investigation, this tumour safari, really showed that there was quite a dramatically uh, defined belt where this lymphoma syndrome was found, right? You had nice sharp edges, so you could travel quite short distances uh, and go from regions where the disease was very common to regions where the disease was very rare or, or even kind of unknown. Um, this was really interesting, and it was really interesting, well, in part because it's, it was unusual, right? Um, we don't tend to think of most cancers as having this kind of geographical basis, right? We know, of course, that disease in incidence varies in different places. We know there's much more, say, uh, heart disease in particular populations in Scotland than that there is in parts of England, for example. But we don't tend to think of tumours as, as having this really kind of razor-edged um, variance in distribution. Um, and actually, so they did quite a lot of work looking at maps and thinking about disease geography. And one of the suggestions that, that came up quite early in this research programme um, was that actually maybe this tumour was in some way dependent on climate, right? We know that climate varies. We know actually that climate can vary quite dramatically in quite short distances, right? So we're, we're all, I'm sure, familiar with, with places where <laughs> that seem unusually rainy or that are always freezing or whatever. But actually, you could do this kind of thing. You could actually take a map of Africa um, and you could, in effect, plot a distribution on it that, 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 that revealed a particular set of climate factors. So actually, this yellow region here is... is um, all the regions of Africa where the mean temperature is above 60 degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, um, apologies for the imperial unit, but that's uh, that's what something like 15 degrees C. Um, and areas that were under about 5,000 feet in altitude, um, and that were wetter than well about 80 centimeters or so over any year. I mean, they they, they say 30 inches. Um, and in fact, you could mimic the distribution of this tumour really well by looking at those climate factors. Now, that's really, that was really surprising, I think. Um, and it raised this kind of very uh, obvious possibility that maybe, because we know that insects tend to favour particular climate factors, uh, or particular sets of, of climatic conditions, rather, um, that maybe this... Uh, cancer was associated in some way with the distribution of an insect and actually at least a couple of, of really good contenders came out which which are I mean quite famous for that in their own right unfortunately so this uh, is the distribution of tetsi fly of the tetsi fly um, and this is the distribution of um, well actually this is the distribution of malaria but that's in you know that that's indicative of um, uh, Anopheles mosquito distribution itself. So there was this kind of suspicion that maybe this was uh, this this cancer had something to do with the presence or, or behaviour or, or something of of insects or, or perhaps something else that that depends very closely on climate. Um, however, it seemed that there wasn't an obvious kind of contender, and actually lots of bits of Burkitt's lymphoma tissue were sent off to research labs in the, the very early 1960s. Um, and at this time, there was quite a lot of interest in viruses. It was a really kind of boom time in, in, in virus research, I think. And um, 
part of the reason for that was a suspicion that maybe viruses were implicated in certain kinds of human cancers. Now, it'd been known for, uh, at this stage for 20 or so, 20 odd years that some kinds of animal tumours were, were caused by viruses. But there wasn't any definite proof, really, that um, any human diseases, any, any human cancers, rather, uh, were caused by viral infection. So Burkett and colleagues' is discovery that um, of this tumour syndrome with this very interesting geographical distribution um, led to quite a lot of research interest from other groups. And these groups were, were a bit different from, from the, the team on the ground um, in Uganda, in that rather than being uh, doctors or surgeons, you know, clinicians, they were primarily laboratory research workers. And one group was led by Anthony Epstein, um, and they were working uh, at the Bland Sutton Institute, which is part of the Middlesex Hospital. This is in, uh, in northwest London, actually not far at all from the, the University College London site. Actually, this hospital is, is no longer with us. It was, it was knocked down about five years ago. Um, but while it, was, uh, while it was still there, it, it really had quite a lot of research work going on. Um, and at this, this stage in the sort of late 1950s, early 1960s, one of the projects that they were working on was about herpes viruses and, and wondering whether herpes viruses might in some way be implicated in human cancers. This is a story that's quite important actually uh, in this course later on. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about cervical cancer and there are some interesting links here. Um, but for now, it's en enough to say that um, Epstein became very interested in Burkitt's lymphoma and he, he became interested largely because he, he went to a lecture given by Burkitt on a, on a trip back to London um, in, uh, I think, roughly 19, 1961. Um, and he made arrangements to be supplied from uh, Uganda with Burkitt's lymphoma material. Now, this didn't get off to a terribly good start. They were looking for viruses, and they really tried everything they possibly could for about two years. Uh, but nothing really happened. They, they could not detect uh, viruses in this Burkitt's lymphoma material. Um, and it, in fact, took until almost the end of 1963, and it took a rather strange accident um, before they, they, they managed to, to sort of achieve some successful results. And the accident went like this, the, the material, the Burkitt's lymphoma material was flown over um, from Kampala to London. And it was flown over as little um, sort of chunks of material floating in a, a kind of liquid medium. So these, these chunks would be removed at, uh, during operations um, and they'd be packed up and flown over to London very quickly actually. Um, now, what happened in this case in the, the 3rd of December 1963 was that the flight bringing the material in got diverted to Manchester due to bad weather in London. Um, and that led to a delay, and in fact this, this sample of material was bumping around in taxis and so on, getting between Manchester and London um, for 24 hours or so. When it finally arrived at the lab, um, the, the people opening it noticed that rather than the usual kind of arrangement, which was a small pot with a bit of tissue in it, um, suspended in kind of clear watery media, um, that watery media had, been, had, got, had got sort of cloudy. It looked like maybe it was infected or maybe it had gone sort of bad in some way. Um, and very luckily, actually, they, they looked at this cloudy liquid uh, transport media under a microscope before they <laughs> threw the specimen away. The specimen was, after all, pressures. Um, and rather than being sort of bacteria or anything terribly unpleasant, what, what was actually causing the cloudiness was cells. They were tumour cells. They'd, they'd been shaken off from the cut edges of the biopsy specimen and had effectively set up a, a culture of free living tumour cells. Now this on its own was really very exciting. It's actually the first, um, the first example of um, a, a free cell line like this set up from, from a human um, from a human tumor of this kind um, and so that was kind of already in in the territory of, of, of happy accidents here what was even more happy though was that when you looked at these cells that had been shaken free in this in this transport media under the electron microscope you could actually see viruses in them um, and in fact, this very rapidly leads to a couple of papers by Epstein, Barr and Achong, the, the three kind of main workers on, on this project, 
um, reporting the discovery of a virus in, in these tumour cells. And it's this virus that becomes known after, the, after two of the three uh, researchers as the Epstein-Barr virus. Um, let me just put up this nice kind of modern picture so that you can see, you can see what it looks like. It's a kind of herpes virus. Um, it's not, it, it, interestingly in the context of the other parts of the story, it's not actually transmitted by, um, by insects or anything like it. Um, in fact, it's transmitted person to person. And what's really surprising, I think, is that it's, it's very common. Um, I know because I... Uh, a few years ago, I worked on this. Was was lucky enough to have somebody do a do a, do a, um, the appropriate ELISA testimony. But I know that, for example, I've had it, um, and we know that in fact most people of my age in this country, so ne nearly forty, um, but more than ninety percent of people of my age have had it. And uh, you know, in, in, by by the time you get to sort of adulthood, you're looking at eighty odd percent of people having had it. And in fact, it's the disease that causes glandular fever. Or infectious mononucleosis, or mono, if you've ever had any of those very unpleasant things, which I'm very pleased to say and feel very privileged to have not had. Um, so it's very common. Um, and it's very common all over the place. It's very common all over the world. It's ubiquitous, nearly. Um, now, what's kind of interesting is that there's, there is some there, there's lots of evidence, really, to suggest that this Epstein-Barr virus causes Burkitt's lymphoma. Um, and I will put a couple of these these terrifyingly complicated mechanisms from recent medical journals up to uh, to sort of hand wave at the idea that this causal claim is quite well investigated. Um, what's much less clearly understood, though, is exactly why infection with Epstein Barr virus um, it nearly everywhere in the world doesn't lead to the development of this tumour. Um, but in certain parts of Africa, the the kind of lymphoma belt that we were talking about earlier. And in a very few other part of the, parts of the world with similar climate, um, so for example, Burkitt's lymphoma in this endemic way is found in parts of Papua New Guinea, um, that the virus seems to have this effect of causing a tumour syndrome. Um, there are some links on the reading list that, that contain some, some kind of well elaborated material about that, but really, roughly, the answer in this case that we're looking at is that it's some kind of interaction of Epstein-Barr with other diseases, and malaria is the likely one. So malaria causes immune system stimulation, um, and in combination with Epstein-Barr virus, that can lead to the, the profusion of these immune system cells and cause Burkitt's lymphoma. Um, but again, that's probably one that, if you're really interested in it, is worth, uh, is worth reading rather than have me um, sit here and explain for a long time. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that's really enough on the case. What we're going to talk about next time is what philosophers have said about discovery. Um, and in order to set that up, what I want to do is just kind of leave you with a couple of open questions about this Burkitt's lymphoma case, which is, first of all, what exactly got discovered here? Um, there are lots of ways that you, you could argue that different things were discovered here. But are we talking, you know, is the interesting bit of discovery here the kind of discovery of a clinical syndrome? Or is it the discovery of a virus that somehow implicated in this clinical syndrome? Or is it more kind of the, the whole package, right? Is it, you know, what, what counts here as discovery of our disease? Do you have to describe all the clinical stuff? And you have to have ideas about where it happens and why it happens and what kinds of agents are, are implicated in that. Um, there are some kind of other questions too, which is, uh, and we will address this one pretty early on in the next lecture, which is, given this material and the kind of uh, the more detailed version that you can find as part of the course materials, um, when exactly would you say the discovery of Burkitt's lymphoma happened? Um, that's a very common kind of historical question, right? We, we argue about when and where particular things were discovered. So when in this story did the discovery happen? Um, anyway, so two open questions for you on that, and hopefully we'll come up with some answers or at least some ideas about how we might answer questions like that in the next lecture where we look at uh, Kuhn and Hansen on discovery. 
Anyway, thanks very much. I hope that was useful. And uh, yeah, look forward to uh, any questions or comments you might have. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Bye.